Hey guys, so I know I've covered this topic before, uh, but I rewatched my old video on it and it's rough to say the least, so I just want to cover it better, I guess, because uh, I think it's important. So let's just get into it. So before I go any further, I want to address what gatekeeping is. While I'm sure most people understand what it is as a general concept, the argument I'm kind of going against here often boils down to gatekeeping is bad, though. The main point of this video is that I don't believe gatekeeping has an inherent moral value. Gatekeeping can be abusive and discriminatory, but gatekeeping can also keep communities safe or maintain resources that need protection, and it can also be neutral or completely irrelevant. I'm going to give some very straightforward examples of good or bad gatekeeping that I think we can all agree upon, just to prove a point, but please keep in mind that I don't necessarily think transmedicalism as, is as serious as some of these topics, um, I'm just listing them because I think they're very easy to agree upon. <laughs> An obvious example I think can be agreed as good or at least harmless is that cishet people are not considered LGBT. Gatekeeping is the act of preventing a specific group from accessing a specific resource or community, and cishet people are not a part of the LGBT community. That is gatekeeping, and it's not a bad thing. Another example of good gatekeeping is requiring a degree to work in certain fields. You wouldn't let someone without a medical degree perform surgery on you. It can also be seen that this is necessary in instances where people do provide medicine without a license, often resulting in complications or alternative medicines such as black salve or MMS being extremely dangerous yet supported by unregulated alternative medicine quote-unquote practitioners. An obvious and agreeable example of bad gatekeeping is TERFs. There's no danger presented in considering trans women women, misogyny hurts trans women and cis women, and there's no benefit to excluding trans women from being talked about and advocated for when discussing feminism. There's also completely neutral examples. You wouldn't consider someone who hates anthropomorphic animals to be a furry. It's not exactly protecting anything to consider those people not furries, but it's also not hurting anyone either. It's just what the word means. The point of this is that gatekeeping has no inherent value. It's a neutral action that can cause harm, but can also protect people. It's context dependent. Where I'm obviously going to go from here is that as a transmedicalist, I don't deny that I'm gatekeeping. I think to do so would be dishonest and honestly counterproductive considering I think transmedicalism is a beneficial form of gatekeeping. I'm not really going to go into why I'm a transmedicalist too much in this video, nor the science behind it or the like, uh, but I will have a card in the corner and links in the description um, to videos where I do talk about those things if you either don't agree or are unaware or whatever, just want to check it out. But to continue from that, I don't think preventing non-dysphoric people from being a part of the trans community or accessing trans healthcare is harmful. While in a perfect world, we would have an endless amount of surgeons and HRT and gender therapists, so there's no wait times or shortages, that's not a world we live in, nor is it a world that we're even close to. If we lived in that world, I would be much more okay with non-dysphoric people receiving HRT and trans-affirming surgeries, and I do think that that's something we should strive for, though I do have some notes on that that I'll get back to later. Currently, there is a testosterone shortage, something that I've been personally affected by as a trans man. There are increasingly long wait lists to even meet with surgeons, let alone receive the surgery, and even wait lists to see gender therapists. In some places, these lists can go up to four or five years long. While there is, of course, an aspect of transness being more openly spoken about and therefore more people seeking HRT who wouldn't have otherwise, there's also been a massive increase in non-dysphoric people seeking HRT, something that has resulted in discussions among medical communities and the trans community alike about the efficacy of informed consent and requirements to receive that care, as well as an influx of D-trans individuals who were non-dysphoric and therefore upset by the changes, becoming angry with trans people in the medical field for allowing them to take these medications. It takes about three seconds to find posts of non-dysphorics admitting they lied to their doctors to receive HRT or even surgeries. Trans people, i.e. dysphoric people, die on wait lists. It's becoming increasingly common to see news articles, social media posts, and even documentaries about trans people trying or succeeding in taking their own lives over the inaccessibility of trans healthcare. I don't want to put this all on non-dysphoric people. It's absolutely a problem within the medical field as well, but there is a blatant disregard by non-dysphoric people for the fact that trans healthcare is a medical necessity for trans people. I've gotten comments and seen posts from non-dysphoric people joking that they're going to quote-unquote steal your trans resources because to them it's not a serious topic. There's also an issue of the political climate surrounding transness right now. I'm not saying this as a quote-unquote pick-me or trying to look good affecting the image of trans people because xenogenders are cringe or the like, but the fact that these people are often sometimes the loudest about quote-unquote being trans while having greatly different needs than actual trans people. While some non-dysphoric people go through medical transition, there are just as many if not more who use phrases like quote, dysphoria is internalized transphobia or quote, passing is transphobic, etc. People who not only actively present as their birth gender and therefore are not generally clockable in public and never have been and never will be as they are functionally cis, but who also, also aren't affected by the plethora of anti-trans bills targeting our medical care. 
They are, of course, angry at the laws, thankfully, but they don't understand what the actual needs of trans people are. It's common to see them share unsafe DIY, DIY HRT resources with minors, advocate for no regulation or minimal regulation on HRT or surgery, simply for whoever wants it, ignoring the detrans issues, among others mentioned before, and often even over sharing information that may make stealth people more clockable, such as an uptick in people calling attention to top surgery scars or phalloplasty skin graft sites. While this is done with good intention to normalize those aspects of trans bodies, in reality, people who would have never been able to clock you may be able to now, and that could be as simple as breaking someone's ability to be stealth or putting them in life-threatening situations that these people people don't face as they are functionally cis in their day-to-day -day lives and aren't at risk of being hate-crimed or attacked or kicked out, etc. I don't think any of this is done with negative intentions, mind you, but this is where the gatekeeping is necessary. These people are not trans, do not understand trans experiences, yet are told that they are just as trans and therefore just as justified to speak about these topics, to take the limited resources, and to educate or more so misinform others about trans experiences and issues, all while lacking the actual experience of a trans person to adequately do so. Before I continue to the note I made earlier, I also want to point something out. A lot of self-identified non-dysphorics are dysphoric. Inclusionists have spread for years that dysphoria is suffering and agony, and while that can be true for some, dysphoria is simply discomfort with your birth sex. There are a lot of people with more mild dysphoria who self-identify as non-dysphoric for that reason, and I want to note that I'm not talking about those people. Moving on from that, um, earlier in the video I said that I had a note about if we could actually provide HRT and surgery for both dysphoric and non-dysphoric people, and I want to touch on that here. If we lived in a world where both trans and cis individuals could access HRT and surgeries with no conflict of interest, I would be supportive of that with a caveat. I still don't think those people should be considered trans, and I think that there should be a distinction made on if a surgery or medication is taken to mitigate a medical condition, dysphoria, or if it's done with cosmetic purposes. Body modification is something I support. Your body is yours to do what you choose with. However, making a distinction in trans individuals versus cis individuals is important here for a few reasons. For one, unfortunately, even if it only happens in very small amounts, transition regret is always going to play a role in how these procedures are regulated, unfortunately. Currently, most transition-related surgeries are viewed as cosmetic. Not only does that make them less likely to be covered by insurance in the U.S., or make them underserved through the NHS in the UK or similar health systems, but affect how they are viewed by doctors weighing the risks of performing them. Complications and accessibility would be seen as more of a dire issue and addressed more urgently if trans healthcare was viewed as a medical necessity. However, this is not the case for everyone who receives it. A breast reduction for cosmetic purposes versus a breast reduction due to back problems are not treated the same. This should be the case for trans healthcare just like every other medical procedure of this type. That can be elective or can be a necessity. Second, about why these people shouldn't be considered trans, Cis people receiving these surgeries or HRT still do not fit the definition of transgender or transsexual, and it's a bit of a problem that trans spaces are filled with cis people drowning out actual opinions and advice from those actually going through the same things as you. As I mentioned earlier, it's rather common to hear phrases claiming a desire to pass or severe dysphoria is actually internalized transphobia. You should be able to seek advice on passing, managing dysphoria, etc. without these kinds of unhelpful interactions from cis people. Something I think is rather interesting in regards to this is that the r slash truescum subreddit, while it absolutely does have a lot of discussion about discourse and trans men ideas, is also filled with people making normal posts about being trans. Selfies asking how to pass better, advice on coming out, experiences with different surgeons, attempting to be stealth at a new school or job, etc. I don't think it's surprising that so much of that community is just talking about everyday trans experiences, and that they often receive much more helpful and less hugboxing type responses than a subreddit like, for example, r slash FTM. Obviously, this isn't meant to be an example of trans spaces as a whole, I just think it's interesting to point out the differences between them. At the end of the day, if people are hurt by being excluded from a community that they're harming and don't have anything in common with, it's not the job of trans people to validate them or make them feel better. I care much more about access to healthcare and the mental health of dysphoric people, trans men or not, than I do about if people who are harming us feel like I'm welcoming to them or if they need my validation. That's it. Thanks for watching, guys. Hade. The populous in prayer I look at them talking to the